We're reading today from Acts chapter 1. This is beginning with verse 6. I'm in the New Revised Standard Version today. So when they had come together, they asked him, Jesus, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set up by his own authority. But will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, to all the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him away out of their sight. The word of God. You can be seated. So forever after, the disciples uh, will rarely now go where they want to go or when they want to go or to whom they want to go. From now on in the Jesus story, Jesus goes up, the Spirit comes down, the disciples move out. That's the flow chart of the early Jesus movement. We've been studying this for several weeks in the book of Acts here in this community. There is one instruction and there is one promise. The one instruction, you'll be my witness. And the one promise, you'll receive power. Something's coming for you to enable you. We're working our way through the book of Acts, church, and the storytellers, the storytellers move us from scene to scene to scene. There's no lack of drama in the book of Acts. If you've been following along, last week in chapter 8, the adventure was with the Ethiopian eunuch, a man from Africa wandering around a desert. He doesn't actually sport a name. He carries, he wears a label. And he meets the disciple, Philip. And we asked the question last week, for whom was this meeting more urgent, the disciple of Jesus or the Ethiopian with no name? And I answered, yes. We need the Ethiopian, and, and the Ethiopian needs us. We pause now in chapter 8 this week, remembering, though, that the storytellers in Acts, when within just a few pages, we will see everything. It's more than any opera could put into place. We will be in dozens, a dozen cities, we will have backdrops like stadiums and theaters and the courthouse. We will have vessels like ships and there'll be shipwrecks and there'll be snake bites and there'll be prisons and there'll be prison breakouts and people will be charged falsely and accurately and people will die. This is the book of Acts. The storyteller goes and goes and goes and goes. A couple assumptions about the people in our Bible. One is that, uh, you know, it takes the courageous and the brave to go. Uh, you will go out and be my witnesses, Jesus says. Oh, well, that's for the courageous and the brave. And then there's the rest of us, right? There's a few who are courageous and brave. And then there's the rest of us. I remember vividly in Sabbath school, the teacher, we would sing the missionary song, Sari. Missionary, missionary, goodbye, goodbye. And the teacher would say, who wants to be like the apostle Paul? And I would say, no. Because Snakes. One assumption we make is it takes courageous people. There's a courageous, brave few like the Fordham family, and then there's the rest of us. And another assumption we make is that the, the, the people who go out simply drop their lives and follow the Spirit, and the Spirit stitches together for them a new story. The book of Acts is a collection of missionary tales, even though the word missionary is not used. 1 verse 8 we just read, you will be my witness. It's a noun and a verb. You will be my witness to the end of the earth. So today we're going to pause. And I want to recognize something obvious and, uh, and missing all at the same time. Lost in the seams of the stories in our Bible is the reality that all of these missionaries have real lives. They are people with histories before they come to the Jesus movement. They have relationships, they have significant others. They have uh, children or grandchildren or not. They had vocations, they had places to go and people to see and their own stories to tell. And those details can be lost in the seams of the stories of our Bible. The people who choose, and there are thousands of them, the people who choose to be with the Jesus movement, we know a few of their names, like, like Peter and James and Lydia and Paul. Paul will take up the next couple of weeks here in our congregation. And we think because there are people like Paul, maybe, you know, you can't have too many Pauls in one story, right? That's a big one. The story with Jesus uh, doesn't need heroes. It needs humans. There are humans in these stories. So today we're pausing with Sari Fordham, and we want to talk about the time, a little family, four of you, Gary and Karina, 
and Sonia and Sari packed up and moved to Africa. <laughs> the backdrop of our conversation this morning is Sari's, Sari's new book, Wait for God to Notice. If you haven't gotten your copy, we won't say more right now, but we will say more later. I invite you to join me right now because we're going to have a conversation. And actually, this conversation is going to start with you reading. We heard one story about driver ants. And as you say, as you say, well, good grief. I'm sorry. There's your grand entrance. I'm sorry. There's, uh, that was one story of driver ants. And as you often say in your book, that's one story. But here's another. I invite you to listen to another. Welcome. So my dad's a pastor, and he's actually here today. And one of the things you get to do as a pastor's daughter is you get to tell the children's story. So I think I was in eighth or ninth grade the first time I told Sari and the Ants. And when I was writing this book for adults, I told this story so often for kids that I was thinking, what would this story look like if it was written for an older audience? So, Sari and the ants, you heard it one way. Let's hear it another way. Mornings, we sat on the veranda, the three of us. My father had long vanished into the reaching branches and tangle that surrounded our house, despite violent spats of slashing at the underbrush. He would reappear in the evening, a stack of papers under a looping arm. This was our world, this hill. It was early and the air was still cool. A breeze shifted the top branches of the bougainvillea. My mother sat looking outward towards her tomato garden. There was a sole survivor, a pinkish fruit she had been thinking about plucking. Today or tomorrow, she wasn't sure, but she had been watching it ripen all week. My mother hummed as she opened her slim Bible. She opened directly to Psalms. It was always psalms and the words dropped out of her mouth like music. I will lift up mine eyes onto the hill from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. My mother read chapter 121 at a leisurely pace relishing the milk and honey of David's language. She was drawn to his metaphors and found company in his ambivalence. In a green felt pen, she underlined a single verse, a passage I never heard her read aloud. It is the rumination of the exiled, and the question must, must have resonated. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? After my mother read the scripture, Sonia and I bowed our heads and folded our hands. We turned one ear to our mother as she prayed for our protection, for our deliverance from snakes. It was a prayer we had heard often, but the words were spoken with fresh urgency. A story had been passing like ashes from mouth to mouth, from mother to mother. The story was this. A young girl climbed the mango tree, the one that sat between the dispensary and the college gate. The girl must have been the daughter of a new student, for we had not played with her yet, would not, in fact, ever play with her. Still I see her, slight and smart, ankles freckled with scars. She stopped at the base of the tree, searching the dark foliage until her eyes rested upon the top branches, upon fruit hanging down like small green hearts. Unripe mangoes, white-fleshed and sour, are best dipped in salt and chili pepper powder. The girl stands, hands hanging at her side, eyes sweeping the trunk as she considers the best way up. I want to tell her now, keep walking. Today is not a good day for green mangoes. But she cannot hear me, and so she must hitch her skirt and dig her toes into rough bark. The girl was bitten by a green mamba a lovely snake, sleek-skinned and graceful. She was bitten several times, machine gun bites that left a row of punctures on her angled arms. It seemed impossible that Mark so small could amputate slender bones from breath and sinew, impossible that the green ballerina gliding from branch to branch bore death as well as beauty. 
Yet let there lay the child, a girl whose mother would later kneel on dry earth, arms outstretched, lashing the air with the songs of her grief. You are never safe. You are never too young to die. Those were the lessons, clean and simple, but my sister and I would not learn them. We were children, fearless in the tradition of all children, and there were many interesting matters. There was a starfruit tree to climb and the dirt pathways we pressed into the jungle floor with our matchbox cars. There were the friends on campus to play with, dolls to dress and parade, and there was a missionary cat who had just had kittens we were aching to see. We shall see, my mother said about the last item. She held a rubber band between her teeth and slid a brush through Sonia's hair. Sonia sat on the stool between our mother's knees and scowled. She had a tender scalp and long, slippery hair that my mother pulled back into merciless ponytails and braids, a ritual I was spared for my hair was short. In the mornings, my sister would often dissolve into tears, sobs my mother had little patience for. Hold still, she said. Good grief, I'm not trying to kill you. And then, unexpectedly, my mother shrieked. The nearly completed braid slipped from her grasp, unraveling like a living thing. My mother paid no heed to the plate as she stood and lunged for the screen door, leaving us to sit in astonishment. Mouths agap, eyes alert, our whole beings wonderfully interested in whatever phenomenon had interrupted our morning. We watched as our mother hurled out the door and down the steps. She shouted again, but it was too late. A monkey had run off with her tomato. And so I have a long section about monkeys and food, and I can tell you that if there's a garden and there are monkeys and there is a conflict between the growers of the gardens and the monkeys, I can tell you who will win. Um, But watching the whole thing um, take place is always a lot of fun. So I wrote a lot about the monkeys and the jackfruit that they would carry and an unfortunate incident with pineapples. Um, And then I pick up with the story of the kittens and the ants. The loss of the tomato put my mother in a bad mood. Worse, because she was aware of how pathetic it was for a tomato to throw her off kilter. All morning, she refused to take us down to see the kittens. I have lunch to make, she said. Then I have to wash the dishes. Then she sent us to our nap. Then she threw clothes in the washing machine. I have to be here to hang them when they're done. My sister and I lurked behind every corner pleading, can we go now? What about now? How will the kittens learn to love us? You promised, remember? Why can't we go alone? Sonia said. Our mother didn't believe in close supervision of her daughters. And despite her fear of snakes, we roamed the hill without much observation. A trip to the bottom wouldn't be so different. Of course, there was the mamba. Few of us children had known the little girl, but our mothers all knew the mothers, and they saw the event as both a tragedy and a warning. Watch your children. All right, you can go, my mother said. My mother was not watching as we set across the yard towards our usual shortcut. A mouth slashed into the jungle's flank. It was not an act of disobedience, but of habit. Mommy said to take the road. I said, trust me to remember. Oh, Sonia said. And we paused at the edge of the yard, straddled between two fates. We're already here. The unspoken knowledge passing between us was that the path was much faster. Yet there was something else compelling us forward something we felt but could not articulate, our mother's hypocrisy. We'd been scrambling about this jungle for months. The danger of mambas was no less then, no more now. If I was a goody two-shoes, Sonia was pragmatic. Come on, she said, and plunged down the trail. I followed as I always did. It was a bright day and then it wasn't. A canopy of leaves muted the sun. And though it was a dry season, the air was cool and damp. 
The ground held its own moisture and gave off a loamy scent of here and home that I would carry with me like a puzzle piece. It was the smell of crushed leaves, lemongrass, pods, earth, and something else. Years later, I would breathe in this smell, and then, only then, would I know I was back. Somewhere on the trail, I elbowed past Sonia, anxious to prove I wasn't slow. I held my arms out, parted branches that swung shut behind me. The bush vibrated with insects and rattle in the elephant grass could be heard for several paces. Our feet were clad in flip-flops, the worn rubber slapping our heels as we walked. Grass scratched at our calves and our steps perturbed locusts which leapt from blade to blade. They were large and their sudden movements startled us. It was a delicious fear. A chance mumba gave drama to what would be just a random walk on a random day. We were edgy enough to sing. Noise and inoculation against the snakes drawn to our disobedience. Children's books had taught us what happened to those foolish enough to disobey their parents. They burned a hole in their mother's favorite dress, ate all the Halloween candy, and got sick. I was hanging clothes when I heard you scream. This was how my mother always began the story of that day. The cry she heard was continuous, one long siren. And she was not sure whether that was good or bad, only that it was coming from the path and she must hurry. She dropped what she was holding back into the basket and began to run. We were not so far down the path, maybe halfway down the hill. The noise was coming from my mouth, gaping like a baby weaver's tears and mucus smeared across my face. Sonia, too, was crying, though she had not thought to pull me off the path. We were both rigid, don't move, don't move, a litany through our heads. I was standing in a river of driver ants. My feet had vanished in the tide, my ankles nearly gone. My calves streaked, my arms and chest spotted, ants were even crawling on my scalp. My legs were ablaze, the soldier pinchers as sound as sutures. They say if one is lacerated in the jungle, driver ants can close the wound. A thousand needles against my skin, and my mother nearly smiled from the relief of it. She yanked me off the trail, my two flip-flops lost in the boiling path. My father would get them later, and scooped me against her side. I was a heavy burden and a loud one. My mother clucked her tongue in sympathy and brushed at my feet. She jogged for home. I was still crying when my mother carried me into the bathroom and heaved me into the tub like a sack of cassava. She turned on the tap. She cupped the liquid in her palms and poured it over my body, stripping off my clothes. The tub filled with black, a film of ant clinging to ant. They tried to climb up the porcelain, back up my legs, some held to my wet skin. It would be a long time before my mother could remove all the ants. It would be a long time before I pulled off the last ant that had wedged itself behind my ear. Finally, I curled up on the couch, looking down at my welts. My mother sat on the couch and held me to her side. Later, Sonia and I went to our rooms to play. My mother returned to the couch. She picked up her Bible and turned to Psalms. I will lift up my eyes onto the hills from whence cometh my help. She still felt the fear constricting in her throat, remembering the bargain struck with God as she hustled down the path. Now held, she saw the gift of protection as a frail thing. She saw her own two daughters as foolish and impetuous and no more worthy than another. What role does luck play? What role does God? She turned her head toward the wall and wept. She cried for the child who died in the mango tree, for the mother who was still mourning. And that is another story. So I added a few more descriptions, but also I thought, started thinking about from my mother's point of view, what was she seeing, what was she thinking? You do that often in this book, and I want to talk about that in a minute. Um, can you thank her for that reading? We just had a book reading. 
in church. Hopefully you can see the screen where you're sitting. Can you situate us in Uganda? There are a couple maps that will come up on the screen that will show us uh, where in the world you were. And the next one, in your uh, story, you often talk of moving from the, the school campus over to Nairobi where things were a little safer. Yeah, so we were about um, an hour outside of Kampala. Um, and so when things were really hairy, we might go to Kampala and take the train to Nairobi or drive off over the border. We're going to scan through, them, through some family pictures. Mm. So this is little Sari. So I was very young when we first arrived, and I made friends with as many animals as I could, <laughs> whether they wanted it or not. Um, they would be loved by me. We're, we'll move quickly through some family photos because you grew and your sister grew. This is your older sister, Sonia. And that's a termite mount behind us. Termites? Yes. Termites. Oh, good look. You keep giving me more things to dream about tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and here is my family when we, I'm um, pretty close to the time we arrived, maybe a year after. And here we are in Kenya. Um, so I am much older here. I'm about um, maybe eight or nine. And that's a birthday party. And here is when my book arrived. <laughs> and this is your daughter helping you unpack your books. Yes, I think she said something like, are you famous now? And I said... <laughs> <laughs> So um, talk to us a little bit about your dad's assignment, what took the family there. Give us that detail as well, would you? So my dad filled out a form to be a missionary and then didn't think about it for a long time. And he got a letter asking if he wanted to go to Uganda and to take what was a certification program and turn it into a college degree. Um, so he was there to teach um, ministers how to be ministers so that there'd be a school in Uganda. And when we read your book, we find out your mother was delighted with this idea. Well, it was so interesting. You were talking about um, in Sabbath school where they say, who wants to be a missionary? They would come to Finland where my mom um, was a pastor's daughter there. And she always was the first to have her hand up because she wanted to get out of um, Finland. And she thought that the mission field sounded exciting. Um, but once, <laughs> once she was there, she was a lot more ambivalent. <laughs> Get, run through that very short list of um, the groceries in the house, would you? The food you ate? Um, well, we always had bananas, which was fortunate. A lot of beans and rice. Um, my father, when he would go to Kenya, would get Milo. It's like a hot cocoa. So um, we would go to the dairy to get milk, and we just had enough for two cups of uh, milk a day, one cup for my sister, one for me, and we would have hot chocolate. So that was... Um, that was our treat at the end of the end of the day. And my sister, she got very like obsessed about food, and in the evening we'd want to run through every meal. Did we really get all our meals? And if my sister got up to leave the table to go to the bathroom, she would say, "Nobody eat my food," <laughs> and she'd come back and check. So we were um, certainly attentive to food. Um, we had avocado trees, so we had a lot of avocados, which is one thing my sister and I didn't enjoy. Um, but otherwise, um, star, star fruit we liked, and um, when it was mango season, we were all set. Um, just for fun, I didn't tell you about this. We're going to give you a creature on the screen. Tell me about this snake. I, I've been reading your book for two weeks, and I swear I'm covered with snakes at home. Ah, the black mamba. That's the black one. And, then... and the green mamba. So the black mamba is um, less beautiful than the green mamba just because it's a little less striking. But it's a fascinating snake because it's one of the few snakes that's aggressive enough to go after you. Um, the green mamba won't. It's um, still poisonous. We have a cobra here. We have a cobra. We sure do. Next. <laughs> What's next, please? Can we get this part over? Um, uh, thank you. This must be a um, viper. A viper. In this book, you talk about snakes dropping from cupboards, and they're in laundry baskets, and they're when your dad reaches for this or that, all of a sudden a snake will be around his neck. <laughs> 
Yeah, I didn't include the picture where he's holding the snake that had fallen around his neck. Um, but yes, that was, that was very, that confirmed all of my mother's worst fears. <laughs> that you should go home. <laughs> <laughs> that we should go home. And then of uh, the, uh, the obvious large fear, you're in Uganda, say a word, a paragraph about Idi Amin, would you? This is the 70s. So it's really kind of amazing, but when my parents said yes to Uganda, they weren't really sh they didn't know as much about what was going on. Um, but when we went to Uganda, Idi Amin had been dictator for a while. Um, a lot of people were leaving. Um, he had already um, booted out, as he liked to say, the Asians. Um, it, it was a really large community. Many of the, um, they were from India, um, they were called Asians in Uganda. Um, had been living there for many generations. So um, we had some friends who then the issue was once they got kicked out, where do you have your passport? Because that was their passport. So a lot of different countries were scrambling. Um, where are these people going to go? Um, I think 20,000 people were, I mean, it was a huge number of people that were evicted. Um, so then we came, you know, kind of trolloping into Uganda, not really, not really sure what to expect, sure that it would be, um, you know, I think my dad's feeling always was if the church was sending missionaries to Uganda, it was safe. Um, so we went there and indeed life on the hill was really quiet. Um, when things got really bad with Idi Amin, um, the Adventist church was, um, the Adventist church was banned along with a lot of other denominations. Eventually the church moved the school um, and we packed up our things and put them in the cupboards and we had a lot of refugees move into our house because even though the Adventist church was banned, um, Bugema was far enough outside of Kampala that it was um, a place of refuge for many people. I'm trying to take all of that in um, because I grew up in, you know, Washington. <laughs> You speak in the book about, because we're Fordhams, because we're Fordhams, that's why, you know, we're Fordham girls, or we're Fordham women, or that's what Fordhams do. What does that mean? Well, for one thing, Fordhams do not make a mountain out of a molehill. And when you grow up a Fordham, you realize that absolutely everything is a molehill. There is really nothing to make a mountain about. Um, the other thing about Fordhams is, um, a sense of adventure and also a sense of, it's really, I was telling my husband last night, what is a Fordham? A sense of self-improvement. My sister and I, to this day, right around November, we start calling each other up and talking about our New Year's resolutions because Fordham sisters really enjoy New Year's resolutions. And we talk about what are the, you know, you can't have a vague resolution. What are the markers of success? And I do think it comes very much from, especially my mom's side, she grew up with a very perfectionism form of Adventism that she absolutely rejected. And yet somehow my sister and I have absorbed this you know, self-improvement desire and it comes through. So every year we have a new opportunity to be perfect. And we're actually really <laughs> excited about this and you know, um, optimistic that this is the year we are going to succeed, <laughs> even though we never do. We have, we have self-help groups for this now. <laughs> <laughs> but we love it. I don't know. It's so weird. Even, even if in February we're not doing any of them, um, we, we enjoy calling each other up and making those lists. Um, you know, along that lines, growing up in a missionary family, can you identify now, raising your own family, what are the imprints still with you, uh, the reality that you grew up in a missionary family? You know, one thing is, is that I love insects and creatures and I am not going to be distressed about anything. Um, when I went on my honeymoon, we stayed in a hotel room in Guatemala that had these huge spiders that were coming down off the walls. And as a missionary daughter, I was the one who removed them from the room. And frankly, I would have been perfectly happy to leave them there because spiders are a wondrous and amazing thing. And, you know, the bigger and hairier and exotic they are, the more interesting. So um, a fascination for, <laughs> a fascination for, um, for God's creation and as an adult, a determination to do everything I can 
to protect that creation certainly comes from a missionary side. I think I really put a lot of my missionary energy these days into environmentalism and thinking about ways to make sure that the wild places are still going to be there for my daughter. I think my mom was very interested in protecting us from wildlife, and I'm very interested in trying to protect wildlife so that when my daughter grows up, there are wild places that she can go to. Um, in Uganda, 60% of the forest has been chopped down since I was a child there. Mm -hmm. And I have friends um, who are Ugandan, who are environmentalists, and who are working really hard to make sure that the 40% of the jungle that remains is preserved and not cut down for sugarcane plantations. So a lot of my energy is going into supporting, you know, um, those who are on the ground in Uganda who are environmentalists. Mm -hmm. I have enough questions for us to pass out lunch and stay here all afternoon. <laughs> and I realize we won't be able to do that. There's so much we could talk about. And you should know, beyond what we're talking about, there, there are writing workshops and podcasts and people doing interviews with, uh, with Sari now because of this book and many things you could listen to online to understand the genre of this book, for example. Maybe two more questions. Why the title? What's the title of this book about? And then why this book now? So I have a really hard time titling, and I really empathize with my students who often will call their stories story one. And I'm like, you've got to give your story a title. It's like living and delightful, and your story is so powerful. It doesn't want to be called story one. But I also understand because I'm terrible with titles myself. So I had a teacher tell me to go through and underline key words and phrases, and I found a line in my mother's letter where she says, wait for God to notice. And she's actually writing to her father, and I'll read the line. She writes, we just found out that the price of one roll of toilet paper is $5, and its size is not enough to use a dozen times. I've read that sellers rarely have bananas and beans. Wait for God to notice. We remember you all with love in our prayers. Um, so that real kitchen table, I mean, she was also concerned about, you know, the, t you know, the terrible death and destruction that was happening. But, you know, as mothers, you're also thinking about how are you going to put food on the table and thinking about all the women who are all around Uganda who are having those questions. And so she's like, wait for God to notice. So I underlined it, and then I knew that that was the title. And why now? Um, <laughs> I wish I had a really amazing answer. Um, but I'm a slow writer, and I, you know, really took my time. Um, I was, I'm also teaching at La Sierra, and if I choose between writing or working on a student paper, I'm always going to choose the student paper they want to hear from me. So um, it just took me a long time to write the book that I wanted to write with the descriptions. But I will say, um, I will speak up for the power of taking your time. Um, as, I, as I was working on the book, I had my own daughter, and I had a second layer of understanding as I was writing and considering. Um, now I was a daughter, but then I was also thinking as a mother, and I think that really helped the book. It's not clearly in the book, but it is definitely like emotionally in the book that this has been written and considered both as a daughter and a mother. So as you mentioned daughter and mother, can we then ask about your mom? Your yeah. mom, who was pretty certain you wouldn't all make it out of Uganda mm. alive, comes home, and it's in the States when she's diagnosed with cancer, and she loses her life here. Can you talk about the tension there between surviving Uganda and coming home to that? Well, it was interesting because when my mother got sick, there was also that sense of don't make a mountain out of a mohel, right? There's so much tragedy that we grew up with that what right do we have to like burrow into our own tragedy. And yet at the same time, I was 25 and my mom had cancer. And that was horrific and terrible. Um, I went to the airport and I picked up my uncles and one of them was saying, you know, God is coming and the second coming is coming. And everyone's a little hysterical about this cancer diagnosis, and I don't understand why. Hmm. And 
They didn't hit me as words of hope. They, yeah. they hit me as words of dismissing what felt like a horrific tragedy as a 25-year-old. Um, you know, your mother, um, you're just starting to form a friendship with your mother. And then you think, what do I do now? So I really, I have to say, I, um, I did a little bit of preaching in the car <laughs> about... Um, words words to say to minister to the grieving and why it mattered and I think that was kind of helpful for me to think about yes this is a mountain this is you know a terrible thing but I will say that um, the life expectancy in Uganda at the time was 46 years old so my mom was 59 when she got cancer so on one hand you know it was horrific and it was a huge and terrible tragedy. On the other hand, it was a horrific and huge tragedy in the context of the United States, but maybe not in the context of the globe. So there's always those dual kind of realities. But that didn't take away from like um, the sadness she felt knowing that she wasn't going to see grandchildren um, and she was not going to be there for much longer. I have a deep appreciation in this book that you allow on the one hand and on the other. We often make things a zero-sum game, conversation, mm -hmm. experience. So Sarah, Sarah will say in the book often, here's one story and here's another. Here's one truth and here's another, which is theologically deep, spiritually useful. I'm sorry. I, I would like to ask you one final question because I think it's related to this. You often tell your students, and we're going to put mm -hmm. a quote from you on the screen, you often tell your students to observe the world as honestly as they can. What does that mean? So I want to have a shout out to La Sierra students and let you all know how amazingly talented La Sierra students are. I am stunned every time I teach. I shouldn't be because I always receive this amazing work. Students are really good at observing their world and they're really interested in a lot of interesting things. Um, but I tell my students to observe the world as closely as possible because we have a tendency to do a shorthand to kind of see what we think we should see, what we think should be written about, what we think a story should look like. And if you can cut through what you think you should say and really pay attention to what it really was like and how you're really feeling about it, your piece is going to move beyond the, the general and into the very specific, into the story that only you can tell. And so I talk to students a lot, especially in my advanced expository writing class where they're writing their own stories that no matter who their favorite writer is, that writer can't tell their story. Um, they're the ones who know, observe, understand, and um, have contention with their stories, because there's also a bit of, um, a good story has complexity to it. It's not an easy answer. You know, there's one story and then there's another story. Um, everyone has those. And so to give students permission to really like pay attention to the details that um, they didn't think mattered in the story because they weren't the details that they read in other stories. And so I had a lot of fun writing the Adventist details in this book, um, really like observing Adventist culture and Adventist music and Adventist food. And, you know, it's not in every story, but I will say like carefully observing Adventism was fun. And so when I have students who are writing um, from an Adventist perspective, you know, I try to give them permission, you know, their Adventist story is going to be different than mine. What does it look like? What are the details? What are the moments that like make that specific experience read specific to the reader on the page? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you will, if you were raised Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you will recognize yourself in much of this book, um, even though it's set in another country in another place. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to hear one last very short reading from Sari, and it occurs to me as I'm listening, and we're, we have the book of Acts in the background, and this very reality, very real reality, that witnesses are simply humans, not heroes. Mm. I'm thinking of you, La Sierra graduates. I'm thinking of you, professors and staff. I'm thinking of you, families and community that rallied in our schools and across Riverside. I'm thinking of you, La Sierra church families, when Jesus says to us, 
be my witness, and I promise you will receive power. And all that means, really, because the book of Acts doesn't uh, define it, it just describes it like you do in your book. You don't really define what your family is up to. You simply keep describing it, describing it, describing it. Annie Dillard talks about lives that are lived this way to be sort of the canvas for the love of God in the world. And she says this, that surprising that God leaves God's dealing, dealings to clumsy amateurs like us. She says, a blur of romance clings to our notion of these people in the Bible as though, of course, God should come to these simple folks, these Sunday school watercolor figures who are so purely themselves while we now are complex and full at heart. We, contemporary folks, we are so busy. So I see now we're they. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? There is no one but us. There's no one to sin, nor a pure heart on the face of the earth, but only us, a generation comforting ourselves with the notion that we have come at an awkward time. Our children busy and troubled, and we ourselves unfit, not ready, having each of us chosen wrongly or made a false start, failed, yielded to impulse and the tangled comfort of pleasures, and we've grown exhausted. But there is no one but us, and there never has been. There are generations which remembered, and there are generations which forgot. We would love if you would read us from the epilogue of your book. Sure. I'll go ahead and stand here. So this was a story that was kind of this iconic story about um, Idi Amin and my mom. And I wrote this story many, many times. 10 pages, 20 pages, and finally I realized I just couldn't get it down, and I thought, you know what? Sometimes less is more. In January 1978, my mother stands in the Entebbe airport, a daughter on each side. Idi Amin has been up to his usual brutality. He has murdered four college professors, scores of Christians in the southeast and 15 men whom he personally called subversive. And these are just the killings reported in the New York Times. My mother gently squeezes our hands and tells Sonia and me to stop staring for goodness sake. And then she whispers, you've seen people before, haven't you? There are more soldiers in the airport than civilians. And in truth, she has never seen anything like this. What are the chances that Idi Amin is here too? We are in this airport because my Finnish grandmother is dying. My mother received the telegram in Kenya after we had escaped by train. Come immediately, the telegram read. She and my father sat across from each other and considered their options. In Kenya, we didn't have enough money for one plane ticket, let alone three. Somehow the plan developed. Our family would, ret would return to Uganda to sell enough of our belongings to buy tickets to Finland. And the three of us would fly out and my father would take the bus back to Nairobi. When the church administrators forbade my father from entering Uganda, my mother laughed. So now it is too dangerous. She laughed and laughed and then she wept. Never mind, she said, I'll go alone. She meant that she, we would go without our father. Of course she would take us. We were her limbs. Our father, ever pragmatic, nodded. My mother sold her wedding gifts on the black market in Kampala. Never mind, she said, knowing that she would never again see those plates and those bowls. Never mind. It was the phrase she used most frequently. She was brisk and certain, as if she had sold goods illegally her entire life. As if she wasn't little oily, scared of her own shadow. She moved like a fury and didn't allow herself to cry for her mother. A.T., 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 she thought, mama, mama, mama. She took the shillings, good only in Uganda, to the Sabina airline office and booked the earliest flight out. At the Entebbe airport, we wait by the gate. My mother opens her purse for us, and Sonia and I pin brooches to our t-shirts and smear her strawberry lips chapstick across our lips. A soldier approaches. Excuse me, madam. How are you, madam? 
My mother jolts upwards. She holds out her finished passport. Her eyes are wild. She assumes that Americans are again in trouble and her daughters will be detained. Maybe her citizenship can protect us. The soldier looks pained, embarrassed. He tells her to put away her passport. Idi Amin would like to welcome you to Uganda, he says. Never mind that we are at the departure lounge. Would you like to meet him? My mother thinks about my father, how willingly he steps towards danger. He is not here. We would be honored, she says. There is no other possible answer. She takes a fast brush to our hair and holds out her hands. As we walk through the airport, people turn away, actively minding their own affairs. Idi Amin is a large man dressed in khaki and exuding so much charm that he seems to fill the VIP lounge. A few other Mazungu are already here, all of them women and children. A bodyguard gestures for us to stand in a row, and Amin stops chatting and walks down the line. A man takes photographs. We are political theater. The pictures will show that Uganda is safe. Look at these foreign women bringing their babies here. See how happy they are to meet the president. When Idi Amin reaches us, he shakes my mother's hand and says, you are welcome. It's the most Ugandan of greetings. My mother smiles and says, thank you. When Idi Amin reaches for Sonia's hand, she holds out her left arm. My mother has heard a story, maybe real, maybe not, about a cameraman killed over a left-handed shake. She hisses, your other hand. Sonia drops her arm and snorts back tears. Idi Amin laughs. He's like a jolly uncle. He bends at the waist and takes Sonia's left hand in his. Look at this one. He says, you are welcome, little sister. When we meet Idi Amin, he is kind and our mother is mean. This is one story. Here is another. After we shake hands with Idi Amin, we board a plane to Finland. And our mother says goodbye to her mother. At the graveside, she stands between us, holding our hands. The sky is gray with unfallen snow. We have not yet become acclimatized to winter or to our mother's sorrow. She smiles down at us. Move your fingers if they're cold. Years later, our mother will reside solely in the land of our memories. Some days, Unexpected days, I will wake to the image of her sweeping through the Entebbe airport, holding our hands. Across the st span of time, she will call to her daughters, and she would tell us that we must always do what we have to do, never mind the rest. Thank you.